from uh, SSC, stroke uh, SSTL. He, he, he wears both hats. Um, involved with the uh, Strand One uh, project. Uh, his uh, real day job is uh, microprocessors and uh, operating systems. Uh, I know him from uh, for many, many years. There you go, Chris. Thank you very much. There we go. All okay? Right. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction. And it's a pleasure to be able to actually finally come and talk to you and do more of a sort of show and tell with really what we've been doing together with uh, uh, SSTL at the Surrey Space Centre. Um, and as Phil said earlier, we've undergone actually quite, quite a few changes uh, between SSC and SSTL. And one of the things that's obviously very, very important to us both is that we maintain, we maintain that link, that special link that allows us to be able to you know, keep flying experiments and flying PhD topics and researches, um, but also to allow SSTL to take what we've done and be able to put it into their new satellite systems. It's worth mentioning as well that there's not, there's not just myself, there's a guy called Sean Kenyon over at SSTL. Uh, he is our partner in crime. Um, and if you caught the Space Boffins podcast, we've been described as, uh, how did he describe it, sort of an old married couple okay, that <laughs> argue regularly over little things. But it's actually a wonderful working relationship. It's a lovely guy. Um, I did think about some sort of Star Wars sort of intro where the, the names just keep getting smaller of the number of people involved, but there's a huge number of people involved that have been helping us out uh, for little pieces about Strand 1. Um, and this is just uh, a few select pieces of imagery, because I could probably talk about this for about a good 24 hours straight. So SSC uh, and SSTO, as, as Phil said, they are primarily looking at sort of the larger sort of satellites, and obviously historically they've had uh, the USATs together with the Space Centre, uh, which have been sort of 50 kilos uh, around this sort of value, um, and they've increased uh, and got bigger to now into the thousands. Um, but what our focus is at the Space Centre is still very much uh, the sort of sub-10 kilos, the sort of nanosatellites, picosatellites, uh, and even femtosatellites, and we've had projects doing all sorts of things for that. Um, and the good thing about that is obviously... The, the price is obviously much, much different. As a university, uh, and to develop things and to have students that work on things, uh, we do need to have uh, some sort of reduced price. So this is a slide that I showed at the uh, IAAA uh, conference for uh, CubeSats in Rome. Um, and it essentially overviews our Strand project. Strand is Surrey Training Research and Nanosatellite uh, Demonstrator. Um, and it's really a technology demonstration satellite. I'm trying to cape uh, on the sort of bleeding edge, on that knife edge, of technology um, to see what we can do with it. You know, one of the things that we need to we, we want to do is we want to make sure we innovate. What can we do, uh, just as uh, other people do here? And so it's uh, built by sorry staff and students in their spare time. Okay, this is particularly important because we all have uh, day jobs, and even though we're all here to now giving up our Saturdays to talk about all the fun stuff that uh, goes on here, uh, when you actually have a day job doing satellites, I can imagine some of them are pretty sick of it. Okay. So they've actually given away some of their spare time uh, in their lunch times, in the weekends, in the evenings, uh, to help us uh, bring this together. So rapid development program with notionally zero budget. Again, they're volunteers. If I probably added up the cost of man time, woman time, uh, then I don't want to even stagger to guess how many man hours we probably sinks into it. Uh, the real cost is in the time with CubeSats um, and in the development and making sure that you can have the same people that do the same job uh, for long periods of time. But one of the key things that we want to do is really provide rapid exposure to real space hardware programs for less experienced engineers. So when I, when I teach sort of spacecraft subsystems um, with no background, some people can be great at microelectronics, they could be great at RF systems, um, but they'll go, well, what's that got to do with space? How do we redesign those things? Um, and the same for SSTL graduates. When they come in, you know, they've never perhaps had any hands-on with any flight hardware, they've never had any hands-on with building and developing things, or even understanding how all these systems fit together. You know, how does the impact of your RS system go to your CAD model and your mechanical model? You know, how does that work with regards to how you fix things? PC-104 standard is a great way of doing that, um, but if you're trying to cram it all in into a four kilo box, uh, it's very, very tight. And again, working with the latest sort of COTS technology and understanding the risks. Um, so we're aiming to do a launch of high sort of risk missions. I guess a lot of stuff hasn't flown. Uh, a lot of stuff has been qualified, uh, but it's always that sort of catch-22. You need to fly it, you need to be able to demonstrate it in space. 
Uh, we can do all of the ground testing we, we do here uh, on Earth, and it still won't be enough. There's only certain sources that you can do, and obviously in space you have the full environment there. So this is what it looked like before, uh, a couple of, couple of years ago, uh, the CAD model in its infancy. I guess this is really more what it looks like now. Uh, it's a lot more complete, every little piece of that, and I'm looking forward to showing you exactly what's gone on with the CAD and all the different features that we've got in there. Um, we do actually provide rapid exposure. It's worked really well. Uh, the link between us has given us not only a lot of visibility at the space center of what SSTL does and perhaps what their key motivations are, but also does the same for them for us. We know that we are working on certain things, and they go, oh, blimey, I didn't know you. When did you get that vacuum chamber? Or when did this, when did this happen? You know, so having that visibility between us uh, has helped us uh, bring it together, even though they're now not in the same building. So I guess when I joined, they were all in the same building. I've been at probably uh, Surrey now uh, for about seven years. So walking down the halls, having coffee with people, uh, talking to them about their problems and the way that you can solve them, uh, just we need to make perhaps a bit more of an effort of it. So that's what it looks like now. The system diagram, again, apologies to people um, that cannot see the system diagram really in, in great detail. I do have some posters if you want to talk to us afterwards. I can tell you all about the system, how it all fits together. Uh, unsurprisingly, we have a nice squared C bus uh, that we, we do some quite specific things with. Um, and we have main standard subsystems. So you have the main core electronics which is uh, an ARM7 OBC, which is actually the uh, Nanomind GOMSPACE uh, A712C. Uh, we have our own custom VHF and UHF transceiver and antenna board. Uh, we use Clyde Space EPS uh, and a 20 watt hour battery. Um, but then the rest of it, it then become, falls into sort of the attitude and orbit uh, control system pieces. So we have uh, magnet talkers, sun and earth sensors, actually with our colleagues at Stellenbosch University. They have uh, some new instrumentation that they're looking to fly. Uh, so we're going to be doing that on this particular mission. The GPS receiver is a standard SGRO5 receiver, so how we can hack that to work on the I2C bus has been quite a fun project. Uh, well, it's been a bane of someone's existence, I can tell you that. <laughs> and then the payloads themselves, obviously we have a smartphone, uh, pulse plasma thrusters, and another sort of what we call high-performance computer. High performance for a CubeSat, okay? So back in about just after April 2010, uh, we did some CAD modeling as to what it would look like, um, just to say, well, how would it work, what would the configuration be, how would it fly, which modes would it be spinning in, all this sort of thing. Um, and this is essentially what we, we came up with. Um, it looks the same as pretty much most other CubeSats. They're boxes that are 34 centimeters, roughly, 10 by 10, uh, with some sort of antenna system on the top. Now, in, in particular, this is, this is a video, I'm not sure, maybe for those of you that are new, uh, perhaps have never seen it, what we have here is our antenna, what we call our modular antenna boxes. We actually have a couple of these for UHF and VHF. And then inside we have the more classical sort of PC-104 sort of stack of subsystems. And you've got the power boards. Uh, this here is our, one of our pulse plasma thruster banks. What we actually have is we have eight of these thruster boards. Um, so, well, we have four in one side, four on one side. So we can actually pitch, turn, roll, or do very small attitude maneuvers. And then we actually have a payload box. So, so anything that isn't... PC-104 standard, GPS receivers, the antenna, the patch that needs to go with that, the smartphone itself, um, these all need to be housed in some way. So what we actually have is we have a payload box uh, that we can then put all these pieces in. And then right at the bottom, uh, we have a butane resistor jet. And so that's really what it looks like. Some of the metrics, we've talked about them, some of them before. So the mass that we have uh, and are looking at here is about 4.2 kilograms. And that's with actually all of our tolerances. Um, it's very, very dense, uh, this particular satellite. Um, as you can see from this CAD model, it literally is crammed in. This is, we actually have two camera systems here, um, and it has quite an odd shape when the cameras come out. Um, and we actually have these sort of weird sort of H-shaped boards that actually fit in between every little gap that we can just to make sure that any volume is used. If we need to fly something, if we're going to do something, what can we put in here? So, we're making sure that we're using all of the available volume. Power turns out to be just over 22.3 uh, uh, sunlit average uh, with our deployable solar panel uh, antennas. And the comms is, is a fairly standard sort of 9K6 V uh, UHF down, sort of V1200 uh, bowed up, uh, FSK modulation. And we have an existing uh, ground station, uh, which is again so one that um, many of you here actually uh, fully know about or even worked in. Right, Graham? <laughs> The AOCS system, a main, most of it is stored inside here. Okay? 
inside our actual uh, payload bay. And that is really because all of these parts need to be protected. If something does happen and the wheel configuration doesn't work uh, and it starts to spinning around, we don't want it to then spin around and through up into the rest of our other systems. It's making sure that we've got perhaps some other piece of protection there. And then right at the bottom, uh, we then have a butane thruster board. Um, but one of the good things about this particular presentation is I'll actually be able to show you a lot of the models that we have and some of the flight models too. Inside the payload bay, uh, we have rod configurations, so making sure that they aren't directly aligned one another because you'll have all sorts of moments and all sorts of strange pitches that you'll soon uh, look to recover. We have our, our smartphone, which actually sits here, uh, which is a Google Nexus, uh, Nexus One. Um, this is one of them right here. This is one that's completely burnt and dead uh, at the moment. Um, there's no point in passing this around. You've all got phones that are now much better than this. Um, the magnet talker rods are uh, made out of custom metal alloy to get the actual pitches we want, but it's making sure that we can fit everything in into this sort of very small uh, payload box. One of the interesting parts about this is we actually have like an ARM, uh, an ARM 9 and Spartan 3 FPGA sort of what we call the high performance computer. It's based on a Y9C interface and that's really to do all the control with the mobile phone. The mobile phone communicates USB, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. I'm never using Bluetooth on that because it's awful and that stack's huge. Um, but, and, the, and the screen itself. So the screen itself, uh, these are all sort of inputs and ways that you can interact uh, on board uh, the system. So. Who are we? I guess this is, this is a picture. We were uh, uh, entered into the Times Higher Education Awards. Um, we came as one of the top three best engineering research projects uh, of the year for the UK. Um, and this is really just a, a makeup of all these people. Please don't read too much into the graph. Uh, one of the things that happened, it was in November, and one of the things you do in uh, November is Movember, uh, which is about male prostate cancer. Um, so every guy here does have perhaps quite an odd facial growth uh, yeah. on their faces. Uh, so don't be alarmed. They don't usually look like that unless it's November. So we, we had uh, this wonderful event, and there's lots of people. And you can see it's just a good array of general uh, stuff from SST and SSTL. But the important stuff. So why bother flying a smartphone? As again, Phil said, uh, they spent billions and billions and billions into making these things uh, as small and as usable as you could possibly uh, imagine. They've tested them and they've integrated all these different functionalities that now we take for granted and we can just fit right in our pocket. But one of the great things that they've already done is they've already qualified them to some extent. Okay? You have people that can leave their phones on the dashboard in the middle of Texas yeah, in the middle of summer and you know, they'll hit 80 degrees, no problem. Okay? They were qualified to be dropped on the floor literally all the time. Okay? They're qualified to, what else? to be chucked around and dropped in the bath or dropped in the toilet in the washing machine and these things are meant to survive. If they can survive humans, uh, then they're pretty much halfway there already. Okay? And of course, they're made in mass volume as well. So we know all the parts that go into these sort of systems uh, are quite cheap. So why Android? So Android itself really leverages Linux. Okay? If you've actually messed around and started configuring uh, an Android sort of smartphone, uh, it's about 90% Linux. Uh, so that's essentially it. The only Android piece that you have is just a user interface and front end uh, that allows you to touch the screen and access things in certain ways, like the way that we handle software now uh, is instead of, you know, pseudo apt getting something in Linux, uh, you're just downloading it and treating it as a standalone app. But it allows us to, to check and drive things. This software is open source. Again, one of the reasons why we didn't go with a Windows or an iPhone uh, is because we can mess around with it. Okay? And we can really start to change some of the things on here. Things about how they handle memory. So I have uh, students that have been way playing with actually how we do scrubbing on board there with the existing memory. Okay? I, I can't change the hardware on this particular uh, phone. Um, so what can we do with that? Okay, you've got a gig of RAM, but are you really using a gig of RAM? Can we triplicate that? Can we perform some error checking? What can we actually physically do? So we have a lot of projects that are looking at changing the way that the software is configured so that it can best operate in an extreme environment. If qualified, the components, again, can be used for, to advance all the small science satellites globally. If you think about some of the processes that we do fly, uh, some of the things that I've seen on uh, perhaps ESA payloads, they're barely getting above sort of 50 megahertz processing power. Do it all on the ground. Okay? This is a low power plus gigahertz plus one core processing system. Okay? 
And if you can do it all up in the sky, you don't have to send everything back. You can do the compression on the craft and then get it to ground, rather than just taking the hit and saying, well, we need the data. So strand, what does it look like? Strand as we know it, this is probably the last probably picture that we did for any main uh, publicity. Again, I've, I've gone through most of the units now, but you can see the structures and the things we actually have out sort of on the bench. And this was in a, in a lab over in SSTL. But one of the things you'll notice uh, here is the smartphone uh, in what we call its sort of Pico tray. Okay? So one of the wonderful things that uh, S SSTL did mechanically was to have a whole sort of core set of trays that sit into a, uh, the direct middle, usually, of a, of a satellite. Certainly they did in the DMC days. Um, and then they would be able to bolt all of those together and it make very, very uh, sound, sort of rigid structures. Um, and that's exactly what we're doing here for this. Except we've kind of mangled the back off of it. And I mean mangled. Because there are bits that are on there now that aren't on there. There are bits that have just been completely taken off. Uh, pieces that have been completely disconnected and floating because I'm never going to use them and I don't want them to be a risk in the actual mission. One of the interesting things that we do have, as I said, is that the phone camera itself has a lot... Uh, has a lot of different interfaces, and the phone screen itself is actually something we can feed back on. And so one of the apps, I think certainly that Dave is uh, working towards as well, is actually how do we use that screen? You know, that's an input thing that we can use. If our USB fails and the Wi-Fi fails, you know, what, how do we get data back off the phone? Because, I mean, they still work. One of the things that uh, was said at the beginning was, you know, make sure you can turn it sort of, you know, turn off your phones for your presentation and things. And mine, I've played with so much, it will turn itself probably back on in all the uh, certainty. You can have these things do very, very autonomous things. And so we're actually, what we're doing is we're actually using then the screen itself as an interface so that we can actually get some data back. Um, moving over rather than text, it will be more graphical because it's just much easier to play with and easier for you to then do edge detection, detection of actual data on rather than actual text. So what have we done? The sort of further research we've done. Well, the main tools that you use are ADB, Android Debug uh, Bridge, uh, and Fastboot that you use to completely flash all of the different memory areas. There's a five memory areas on the phone, uh, PROMs, RAM image, uh, data, uh, user data. There's all sorts of uh, actual partitions. We've pre-compiled them uh, now for an embedded system. So we actually spent quite a bit of time into making sure that we stripped out the source uh, that we needed so that we can actually then go, well, if we need to reflash it, the other computer can just reflash it. So we've actually got all those binaries pre-compiled now uh, for Micro Linux and ARM9 systems. We've worked hard on making sure that we get these Pyth we use Python scripts to execute our tasks and comms. And even though you can't see that there, do come up to me and talk to me uh, about it afterwards. I've got all the high-res uh, pieces uh, on my uh, laptop. So we use Python scripts to execute tasks and different communication modes. So you, you know you can use obviously USB, Wi-Fi. You can also do Telnet. You can do FTP, you can SSH, you can do all sorts of different schemes okay, that all offer advantages and disadvantages, whether or not you're doing just a piece of telemetry or whether or not you're transferring files. Okay? So we've got all sorts of different scripts for doing those things. All of the code we have is available on S-Android. So S-Android is a Google Codes uh, project. I've got a couple of slides on that. Uh, so that you can actually see how we're doing the communication and the control structure. And then how we're taking the telemetry from the rest of the satellite and bringing it onto the phone. Because actually some of the apps uh, are really great and they do some wonderful things. And they might need the magnetometer data. They might need to know what your state vector is for your position, velocity, all these things. And this is really what it looks like, just more of a closer up look. So we've been able to interface those things over USB uh, and Wi-Fi on various different ways. Uh, and we're writing a paper there for that that's going to be in IEEE Aerospace, uh, which is for Montana, in Montana in the States. So S-Android, uh, it's a Google Codes project. Okay? You can go there, you can go on, and you can click download our telemetry app that will then start to collect all the telemetry from your Android phone. Things like temperature, uh, light sensing, uh, position velocity, orientation, all these things, they're all telemetry points. Okay? And they're all MEMS-based uh, sensors, one of the real key things we want to test. Not just the processor and the memory systems that you have on there, it's got this whole suite of sensors as well that you can actually use. Um, and from the experiences that I know that I've... Uh, with the conversations I've had with the NASA uh, PhoneSat project, they're obviously very, very interested in, in all those things as well. And they compare them directly uh, with the actual flight equipment that they do use. Uh, and they, they're very comparable, actually. So you can go on there. We have developers' wiki entries to get you started. So if you wanted to hack your phone, there's actually some entries there about how we go about doing it uh, as well. And then the developer notes of then how you can then go away and go, right, well, you don't need any of that stuff, but you need this stuff here. 
go and download this uh, and then start to compile your work. So what does it look like? This is what it looks like. This is our payload bay that you can see right here. Um, this is the main box with just one of the panels taken off. Uh, this is the, the ARM9 and uh, uh, Spartan 3 FPGA. The FPGA itself actually just does the mirror, some of the adaptive medium access control work for the Wi-Fi. Um, and we are currently are connecting uh, Ethernet back to the computer and we just have a very niche sort of, uh, sort of USB cable. For flight though, the USB connectors are coming completely off uh, and they will be soldered directly. Uh, or there is a chance we actually have a specific flight connector we want to replace the USB with. And there's a picture of one of our people, Tom Frame. As I said, there'll be lots of names coming up here. If I, if I remember them, and I try and remember them, there's just, there's just too many people involved. And there he is, uh, helping us program some of the pick pieces uh, that we have operating on the board. Will it work? Mm, very interesting question. So we've already done thermal vacuum tests. Okay? Minus 10 to plus 70 uh, for long periods of time. It worked fine. Uh, we've had them in vacuum chambers for days and days and days and days. No problem. No outgassing, no loss in measurement uh, in, in the systems we want. Uh, radiation testing. These are the images that you see here. Uh, one of the first tests that we did on a couple of the phones at NPL. And again, we did. you can only see it in the distance. The phones are right here. Really, really tiny things. What we actually had is the Cobalt 60 source, which is a, a sort of standard gamma ray uh, bombardment system uh, that we were beaming uh, onto our onto our phones to actually uh, simulate low dose rates. Uh, so there are various different ways in which you can do qualification. Uh, typically, we will bombard it very, very quickly at sort of killer ads, killer ads uh, in, in days. Uh, but there are perhaps issues with things called uh, enhanced low dose rate radiation effects. So we wanted to make sure that we could check against those two. Um, and this is them all working after those tests. Uh, I then did another test where I completely destroyed them all because I really wanted to know what the limits were. So this one here, number 1912, might give you an indication of how many of these things I've burnt. Um, this is completely dead. Okay? Uh, it's not nuclear. I don't just have a lead box sitting around somewhere where I've just got to just chuck them in and just be done with it. Uh, I don't need to do that. Um, that will typically happen uh, when you do single event testing. So when you actually put in large energy sources on there uh, that actually will uh, create isotopes in, in some of the materials, uh, then it becomes nuclear. Uh, those tests are very expensive, and I'm trying to get them for free in my volunteer time is pretty tough. Um, but hopefully I'll do that at NPL at some time soon. But all the indicators so far, very, very good. Magna talkers themselves, uh, this is just a shot of them in production. Uh, it uses 28 uh, AWG gauge sort of copper wire uh, with some very specific cores. Um, this is Ben Taylor here, one of our postdocs, who said that he would help us wind up the 35 meters necessary for each of the magna talkers that we have. Uh, we've actually built a number of different magna talker rods because we're using them for different systems. Certainly for strand two that I'll talk to you about tomorrow, uh, we actually have some document mechanisms uh, that do need uh, rods and other magnetic systems uh, as well. But we actually have this machine which predates sort of sort of in the 1900s uh, where you're winding it sort of up manually. Uh, and it's very tedious and I'm glad I found someone else to do it. Pulse plasma thrusters. Um, Pulse plasma thrusters are a form of electric propulsion where material uh, is ablated uh, from the surface, uh, essentially from a spark. If you think of a lightning bolt hitting the ground, what it does is it ablates it and you will carbonize, not uh, typically what happens on, on the floor, but it also creates a set of ions. Okay? And like any other sort of thruster system, um, you will typically emit some sort of mass, okay? what we call our M dot. Okay? What is the actual flow that you're spitting out at the back of your thruster? And usually we heat it up so we can get better performances out of that. Um, but if you can then reduce everything back to its base materials, you can actually get very, very high specific impulses um, to ensure that you actually have, even though it's a low thrust, because you've got a very, very low mass, that they're actually quite high performance uh, thrusters. And so like I said, this is just the set of eight uh, altogether that we've actually tested and currently in our SSC uh, labs. Uh, and this is sort of it firing. It actually creates a very, very cool purple uh, sort of glow, depending on sort of what, what materials you use, uh, the actual plasma that will come off from these electric propulsion systems uh, will have different effects. So argon will be green, or if I remember rightly, uh, and other ones will be purple, this sort of thing. Very Star trek -y, looks awesome. Okay? There are videos of it on YouTube. I do suggest you go and talk to uh, Dr. Pete Shaw, who's at the university. You can look him up. Uh, he's a wonderful person, and he'll talk to you about it for hours if you're really, really interested in it. He's the real plasma uh, physics 
uh, and sort of engineer that's been working with us. And actually, this is what he looks like. So the CAD and structure, uh, it's an opportunity for everyone really to get involved, to figure out what that impact is. We've got RF guys that are figuring out how to do CAD, uh, electronic engineers that are doing it. I did the first CAD uh, before I handed it over to him because there was just too many things to do on a sort of mission sort of with this uh, of this size and magnitude. And this is him uh, checking over uh, the actual deployment test pod that we had uh, received from ISIS as well, working on our, one of our strand works. And some of the things that you can do is you can then start to say, well, if these engineers that are designing an RF system then figure out, actually, well, how does it fit? How does it connect to all of the other systems? Uh, then they can actually have such, so much of a better understanding with qualifications and knowing what, what could go wrong during a design phase. And so the actual RF system that we have is we have sort of an antenna board, which is what we call, uh, well, which has our set of modular antenna boxes for VNU at GF, uh, which we then have all the front end parts on the other side. Uh, and we then have our digital board uh, on the other side. And the reason for that is that we can just separate them out so that we can have different people working on them at different times. Uh, and then they become modular. If we change our frequencies, if we change our front end, uh, we can actually still use the same back end, which works actually very, very well. Uh, certainly for future missions. Because say, let's say you design a system that definitely works over AX25, HDLC, does all the things that you want it to do, and scrambling and encoding, um, but then you've got to change all your front end, redesign this, think about a queue, all, all the other bits and pieces that we need. It was just made sense for us to just separate those systems entirely. And so this is uh, the actual flight one uh, in the SSTL clean rooms. Um, so again, we've, we've been building and working pretty hard on all these different systems. Solar panels. Uh, Nimal here has done an excellent job of building our solar panels. Uh, again, one of the most expensive parts on our spacecraft, when you really start to cost it, can often be the solar panels. If you don't have the power, you don't have a mission, essentially. Uh, and these ones, sort of panels, when they're actually f all fully lit, uh, they will generate over 22 watts, uh, like I previously said. So these are triple junction cells. Uh, they're actually ones that are taken from uh, SSTL ones that are thrown away. So they've gone through processes where they've gone, no, this one is deformed here. This one has a hairline here. And we've gone, no, we'll take them. We'll take them. That's fine. We'll take these other cells. And we'll put them together and we'll characterize them and see which ones we can actually use rather than sending them back or throwing them away. And the mouse done a great job. One of the things that he's, we've been working on is making sure that we can update our Facebook and Twitter pages. One of the things we do have is we do have quite a, quite a few people that go on there. We do upload regularly some of these images. Most of these, though, you will, uh, are new and you haven't seen. Um, but often there's cases when we do something and we think it's really cool, we'll just go, Facebook it, fine. Uh, and do go on there and check it because we'll have updates on all sorts of things. And then you can directly ask the people that are developing the things some of their questions. So other CubeSat developers that are around the world, do talk to them. Uh, they're there. We're all connected now. That's the whole point of social media. Uh, have that conversation. Again, anything that goes on Facebook gets automatically put on our Twitter as well, so you can do that too. Uh, the OBC and NECS development. Uh, like I said, we use uh, a Nanomine board, uh, which is, uses the ARM7 and what we call a WAF build, which is sort of a Python script uh, instead of a make file. Um, and we've been developing our AOCS algorithms for a classical satellite controls, so wide Thompson spins, B-dot controllers. Uh, so when it comes out of a craft, one of the things you need to do is assess how it's detumbling uh, and put it into a spin that's more acceptable in one principal axis before you can then start to stabilize your spacecraft because I don't want to start taking pictures with the camera phone and they're just all going to be blurry. The actual layering system that we have, other than the physical modem, HDLC, uh, and then we've decided to go for IP and specifically uh, UDP packets. Uh, IP now uh, is available on pretty much every PIC or microcontroller that you have, whether it be a web server, some little piece and pieces. Uh, and what we do is we directly map uh, our I squared C node addresses and telemetry points uh, with our packets and UDP frames. Uh, so it actually makes us, it turns our satellite system diagram into an actual, more like a terrestrial network that you see here on the ground. It makes it very easy for us to do software development as well. If you can imagine developing that, there's all these libraries that have already been used, and they're used in industry and in cars, everywhere. Okay? And we just want to leverage, again, some of that software that's been able to do that. Uh, one of the additional things, we have two control modes. We have a, a manual mode, which is command and receive, and then we have something called Strandatoga. Uh, for those of you who know uh, Saratoga, which is a delay-tolerant network system, uh, we're essentially creating a reduced down sort of reverse acknowledgement system, so that whenever we're streaming down data very, very quickly, we know what packets are missing or which packets 
uh, fail the checksum, for instance. So we can then say, we need these packets back on the next pass or right at the end of the pass. And that's just an image of it uh, all working on the board. Butane thruster. This is uh, the final flight model. Uh, we've done burst tests um, on a lot of the tubing, uh, tested all the welding. We've even tried some new different ways of doing uh, and fixing things together, uh, which we're very happy with. And we've tried uh, and testing all the outgassing as well for all the filters and valves. So just to give you sort of a flavor of the things that are, are sort of going on and who's involved. Um, but really one of the things I wanted to say to you as well is that, you know, as, as SSTL have moved out, we've had a real opportunity at SSE to move in and see uh, what, what's sort of left. Um, and one of the things we've been able to do is, is, re, uh, is, is build our own clean room. Um, so we've actually got our own full uh, clean room now uh, over at the Space Centre uh, so that we can then go away and actually build all sorts of our own parts in our own time, in our own lab. And that's just not just for Strand, but also some of the other missions like CubeSail uh, and the QB50 program uh, so that we can know that we've already got a clean environment to operate in, uh, uh, in for, for all these missions. But we also have research in there as well, uh, specifically for optic systems that do need to have a clean environment uh, rover payloads as well. If you're doing uh, spectroscopy experimentation, you need to have a clean environment, ideally, to be able to do these, this sort of work. And the same for surgical robotics. We have a robotics, uh, two robotics groups uh, at the Space Center uh, who are starting to move into doing control of uh, surgical robots and arms that, were, that could eventually be used uh, for very precision control uh, when we're looking at um, satellite systems too. So all this sort of stuff is sort of very wonderful, and this is sort of the, the development that we've been doing. Um, but the teaching and outreach is something that we still do, and we will continue to do. We have MSc programs, engineering ones, uh, and short courses, even going out to schools. I love going out and talking to uh, people, especially at schools and with the media, because we work. We've been working on CubeSat Kit actually since 2005, really, uh, when the ISAT came around, and uh, David Barnhart, one of our PhD students, came along and was developing this. Uh, this is a system, essentially a nanosatellite that uses the PC-104 standard that you can just pull apart. And we actually use it to teach. So we have six of these in the lab uh, that people can then take apart, see how they fit together, how the systems operate, and actually how you do test. Test is a very, very important part of that. And a lot of our boards are designed for test. So in summary, uh, since well, 2020, we've been working on a new design uh, for CubeSats to make sure that we can really be on the bleeding edge of technology uh, and involve as many people as we can. We want to be able to fly our novel research, train all the new engineers and new people that come to us to get the hands-on experience that they'll need, um, but also to challenge industry processes. Uh, we have a Wikipedia page that we put all of our documentation up on, rather than writing very formalised documents, for instance. Um, and to do it, and be innovative in this sort of very tough economic climate, it's been very hard, and obviously we still are massively unfunded. We don't have any money uh, to do this. Strand 1 is a mix of COTS, really, subsystems, and many new subsystems. Primarily, we have a lot of uh, AOCS experiments, all the wheels, the rods, all the extra pieces that you want to do to make sure you make your CubeSat three-axis stabilized rather than a passive magnet or an electromagnet. We can actually do pitch roll your maneuvers uh, to 0.2 degrees accuracy. As well as that, we've obviously been continuing to make sure that we can get as many people as we can involved uh, and to make sure that our link between SSC and SSTL uh, continues to grow and grow strong. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank you very much uh, for your attention and to those that are online, I salute you. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd love to take them. Yes, so a lot. How, how do you get rid of the heat? It can be. Certainly. So the, the question was is how do we uh, get rid of heat in certain attitude modes? If we're three axis uh, stabilized, one of the spins that we do go into is a, uh, a sort of a sun basking mode, so a sun pointing mode. Uh, and in that case, you are in and out of the sunlight every orbit or so, and these are qualified to go on SSTL missions. Uh, so there's actually not a real problem with heat. Uh, when I looked at the actual temperature and we did a model of the spacecraft, our nominal temperature on average was about five degrees. Steve. Hey, Chris. Um, I was wondering about the, the mobile phones and mm -hmm. how difficult it is to keep up with the advances in the mobile phones um, 
So is, is it is it something that you've you've bought a lot of of Nexus ones? What's what's kind of the next one, and what, <laughs> how do you keep up with that? Yeah, well, of course, uh, we'll be using the iPhone five. Uh, we're not u we're not using the iPhone five. It, it doesn't didn't really add anything. Uh, but that's really a wonderful question. Oh, that's wonderful. I'll talk to you about that later. Um, the phones is a very uh, important question, and one of the things that you have certainly with this particular project is people are going, there's a new phone, we should just change it, chuck away this old one. Um, we can't do that. If you fix a mission and you fix a size, physical size and dimension, uh, and interfacing like uh, that you've spent all this time interfacing and debugging and testing all this part, um, then you've just got to go with it. Uh, the new phones uh, and the work that I do, so I, I lead the onboard data handling group, uh, I, I, I teach that, uh, as well as to have PhD researchers that work on uh, computing as well. Uh, we'll be separating out the phone a lot more. So we won't just be flying smartphone bits. It will be, I want that processor. I think the Snapdragon's great, and it's got a GPU that can really do some ACS functions that are wonderful for me. Um, but the memory configuration, I would never do like that. It needs to have EDAC, it needs to have uh, TMR, perhaps control, um, and we can integrate sensors, perhaps in a, perhaps a much more effective way that allows us to test and qualify uh, our parts. So yeah, great question. Um, we can't keep up with it. Space industry can't. As soon as you start a project and you say it's three years, uh, I imagine we'll be on what fifty cores by then. Um, something like that. So. Uh, what's the uh, the design lifetime of the of the satellite? Do you have any idea how long the phone will last in space? I do have an idea how long the phone will last, and it will certainly last over five years. Uh, I'm actually writing a journal article at the moment, um, which actually tells you all about the testing that I've done. Uh, and I'm waiting to do this last set of single event testing. That's the real one uh, that, w that actually worries me. Um, the biggest feature size that you have on, on spacecraft uh, is, is down to sort of the transistor level. How big is that transistor, or how big is that part on your craft? Okay? And 90 nanometers and 67, those sort of foundries are starting to disappear. Everyone is going much, much smaller because those feature sizes offer much better uh, power efficiencies, you can get more dense things onto it, you can do wonderful things like fit all the functionality that Howard's done, and put it all on this tiny little thing, okay? Um, but that actually doesn't bode well for radiation. The largest sort of uh, particle, let's say, that comes out of our sun is an ion sort of proton, okay? And that's at maximum about 90 nanometers. So if you imagine this 90 nanometer sort of 100 mega electron volt part hitting this memory area, okay, and it's all on sub. 25 nanometer processes. It's not going to just take out one part, it will take out more than one part. Um, so that's really where the tests really need to go. But do watch this space because that publication I think will maybe upset some people. Might not do, uh, won't upset me. So I think it was a really good idea. Is it, um, is it that, five year, that five year program mission life, did you sort of plan on deorbiting? Uh, being that there's quite a lot of clutter around there, is that mm. part of the sort of scheme now to just try and get? So the question was about deorbiting and what our strategy was, if I'm encapsulating that right, uh, for deorbiting. Um, so deorbiting is dependent on really sort of two things. One, what your semi-major axis is uh, in your, well, okay, let's go back. What's your altitude, okay, that you're at, okay? If you're above 800, you're going to be up there for quite a long time, almost irrespective of perhaps some of your mass. Uh, the other part is at what point in the solar cycle are you? Um, so the sun at solar maximum actually causes uh, geomagnetic fluctuations. It's very, very active. And it actually causes our atmosphere to swell because actually the temperature increases as well. So there's, if there's, if our, essentially if you see, think of our atmosphere as like an ocean state. So when it's, the sun's low, it's sort of very nice and steady sort of waves as if we are in the ocean. And as soon as it gets a bit choppy when it goes to solar maximum, it's, the waves are up and down like this. And so what that actually does will mean that you can do a bit quicker. So at solar maximum, you do a bit much, much faster than you were at solar minimum. Um, but the actual strategy is, is that we've actually got pulse plasma thrusters that can go on for actually quite a long, long, long time. And we can just keep firing them every second, just keep going closer and closer down. And it's just that initial accelerations that you need. Um, and then if worst case is, uh, is that uh, we then use more than one. So the strategy is that we can certainly deorbit within 25 years. Debris is a, a wonderful problem, uh, and we can talk about that. I, get, I could do a whole talk on debris mitigation uh, for that and the orbit requirements. Uh, but yes, yeah, so we've got eight thrusters plus a butane resistor jet. If we really needed to, to bring ourselves down, we could easily do that.
having these modern mobile phones, I'm just wondering if it's possible to do away with all the processors and set the phone. Uh, yeah, well, that's actually what NASA uh, Ames uh, is doing on their phone set. Uh, so theirs is a 1U uh, CubeSat, and it essentially is the phone uh, with a radio board, because we convinced them that the, or obviously the S-band would probably not work, uh, and then batteries. Uh, so their one is much more uh, risky uh, in terms of that. Uh, but ours is obviously it's a more classical satellite design. Uh, we have payloads, we have subsystems, uh, because the payloads may not work. Yes. I'm not going to put all my eggs in one basket. I understand uh, that. Because otherwise, uh, I can imagine the tears that follow from some of the students and staff that do work on the project. Uh, Very sensible. Yeah. <laughs> so the question was, is uh, when uh, is Stram 1 due to launch? So the official line uh, that I have to give is there is no official launch yet. Um, but... Uh, we do have, we're in talks literally daily with all sorts of things, but unfortunately until we've seen someone sign the bottom line, uh, there is no official launch for Strand. I guess if there, oh yes Steve, Sorry, go for um, it. You, you mentioned with your TID testing, mm -hmm. you did some compensations, compensation for ELDRS. Um, mm -hmm. Are you able to say kind of what you did there? Mm, probably not. It would be better to wait for the journal. Okay. Uh, because uh, if I'm doing work and I'm going to start doing work with other companies, uh, then some of this information could easily be sensitive. Could you imagine me like, uh, qualifying like, the next iPhone, right? And then going, it's never going to work. It can't work in any harsh, harsh environment. And it doesn't work at zero degrees. And it does this funny behavior at plus 50. People just won't buy it. And that billion dollar industry goes down the toilet. So uh, I have to be quite careful. Is that right? The iPhone 5 doesn't work at zero degrees Celsius? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sure there's... Uh, I, I need a lawyer. Does anyone here know uh, a lawyer at all? Because uh, I, yeah, I may get brought up... Uh, well, well, I've said it now. That's too late, isn't it? I think... <laughs> I haven't done those tests yet. So I assume that if they give me some, uh, I'll put them through their paces. Oh, great. It's been uh, wonderful talking. Thanks very much. Thank